Welcome to our CTS Net Roundtable. Today we're going to be discussing the concept of dedicated research time for residents interested in cardiothoracic surgery. Specifically, we're going to try to address ways to make the most of one's experience. My name is Mara Antonoff. I'm a thoracic surgeon at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Today I'm joined by several trainees who have been very productive during their dedicated research time. Let's begin by getting to know our panel. Can you all please introduce yourselves, tell us your year of training, and where you're doing your clinical training. My name is Kyla Jobier. I am a integrated cardiothoracic surgery resident at University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, and I've completed two years of research. Uh, my name is David Nelson. I'm a general surgery resident, third year general surgery resident at Loma Linda University. I just finished two years of research. My name is Erin Corsini, and I've completed two years of clinical training at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and I'm in my first year of research. My name is Kyle Mitchell. I'm in my second year in the lab and will be returning uh, to my third year of clinical training at the University of Texas in Houston. Terrific. Well, we have a wonderful panel today, and so let's get started. Dr. Nelson, can you start us off by just telling us what you'd hope to gain from spending some time specifically focusing on research? Um, so I did uh, clinical research during my research time, and uh, I knew I wanted to do clinical research because I knew it helped me advance a career as an academic surgeon. Um, and I it spent a year prior to um, uh, prior to medical school at the National Institutes of Health. So I had some background in basic science research before all this, but um, I knew I needed to develop clinical research skills um, for the career. Some of the specific areas um, that I uh, wanted to strengthen were, um, one of them was to uh, be able to efficiently uh, critique literature. Um, so to be able to read a paper and uh, quickly get to the bottom of what its strengths and weaknesses are um, was one factor. Um, another one is to learn how to efficiently produce papers. Um, you know, how do you come up with a great research question that's practical, you can answer in a timely fashion. Um, and then also uh, how to, um, you know, uh, crank that out in a way, you know, that um, works well with a, an uh, a career as a surgeon. Um, you know, you have to learn how to be efficient and so forth. And so yeah. those are good skills to learn during research time. Um, another thing that was really beneficial about doing research time was the networking. Um, you know, uh, for one, you gain mentorship within your department, which is incredibly helpful. Um, another factor is uh, when you go and present at meetings, you meet a ton of different um, other uh, surgeons, and uh, those relationships end up being really important. Yeah, you've mentioned a lot of really fantastic benefits to spending dedicated time in research, and I think we can actually elaborate on some of those benefits as we talk a little bit further in, into all of these different areas. But I think, yeah, you really obviously gained a lot during your research time. Dr. Jobert, another benefit of doing research in CT surgery is exposure to the field, to figure out if you really actually like it. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's really important for individuals who are interested in CT surgery to make sure that their research is specifically in cardiac or thoracic or whatever they plan to do clinically? Or is it really just important to do high quality research? Can you talk a little bit about that balance? Is it okay to do great research on a topic that has nothing to do with your field if it teaches you the same skill sets? Right. So when when I decided to go into research, I was finishing up my third year of general surgery, and at that time, I was considering going into cardiothoracic surgery. Um, so, doing the two years of dedicated research really solidified what I wanted to do. It really uh, tailored my interests, and, and I knew from then on that pursuing a path or a career path in cardiothoracic surgery was the right answer. Now, during my years of research, I, I did research in uh, general thoracic or in um, uh, thoracic oncology as well as um, lung transplantation. I don't necessarily know that my career will point in the direction of uh, lung transplantation, but I think it was a great experience to uh, use my skills and develop a research project no matter what the subject is. Yeah. Absolutely, I would agree with that. And ideally, if you're doing research, at least in the general specialty where you, where you end up eventually, it can be particularly beneficial. But I also spent a lot of time doing basic science bench work on pancreatic cancer cells, and it, it turned out really actually fine in the end. I learned a lot of skills that were ultimately applicable to my understanding of translational research in lung cancer. But I think you're right that um, it can also expose you to different subspecialties within the field and really help you learn what you might want to do clinically at, eventually. Dr. Mitchell, I have a question for you. Um, Dr. Nelson briefly mentioned, men, mentioned mentorship as one of the great advantages of spending dedicated time during your residency to do some research. 
When it comes to lab mentorship, how important do you think it is to have one primary mentor versus multiple mentors? Is it possible to work with multiple mentors on different projects? And can you address that question for us a little bit? Sure. Um, so I'm of the opinion that it is incredibly important to work with multiple mentors, uh, provided you're able to meet everybody's expectations. <laughs> Sure. So I uh, actually had the opposite experience uh, as Dave. I went into the lab expecting to do clinical research outcomes and, and strictly focus on that and stay far away from the lab. Um, but because I've you know, had the opportunity to work with several surgical PIs, uh, as well as a medical oncologist and a basic scientist, I've actually discovered a new interest in translational research. And without you know, having done that, I would, I would not have had that opportunity. Um, so I would, you know, to anyone, anybody who's going into the lab or a resident who's considering going into the lab, uh, I would absolutely recommend, you know, working with, with several mentors if possible. Do you guys think it's important to have a primary mentor, even if you're working with multiple mentors? I think it's good to have a primary mentor that you're checking in with on a regular basis and someone keeping you on track, making sure you're not falling behind in your timeline. Sure. But definitely having different mentors with different interests that, that say you have one uh, mentor who's really great at developing the statistical analysis on a yeah. project, or, or another one is you're great just bouncing ideas off of for the project, using um, the mentor's interest to your advantages important. And I think, too, that a mentor can help guide you outside of your research time getting you to meetings, making sure that you're meeting people, that sort of thing, in addition, as well. yeah, in addition to being productive for in sure. the lab. Well, Dr. Corsini, I'm also hoping to talk about some of the strategies for being as productive as possible. Do you have any brief tips that you could share of how you're able to be as productive as you can and getting um, projects done at, at, in an uh, expeditious fashion during your yeah. uh, research time? So I think something Dr. Mitchell mentioned was uh, making sure that you're spreading your uh, experiences across a wide variety of topic areas with a wide variety of mentors. And I think that'll help to uh, ensure that you're greatly productive. But I think in addition to that is keeping track of all of the meetings. I know I have several spreadsheets that list out mm -hmm. yeah. every upcoming meeting from general thoracic to cardiothoracic, critical care, education, uh, even general surgery to make sure that I see the horizon, I'm preparing for every one of those meetings, and I'm keeping on track with all of my mentors and projects to make sure that I'm submitting something to each one of these. I, I think that's great. And you know, one of the things that I try to do when I meet with mentees about new projects is really try to establish expectations from the very beginning. How long do we think this project is gonna take? Where would we like to aim for this abstract to go to a meeting? Where would be the subsequent paper? And even trying to establish early on what will the authorship be, just so that everyone has reasonable expectations from the beginning. You might not know the exact authorship of the entire group, but at least understand what, who's going to be first, second, who's going to be senior, trying to figure those things out and, and having reasonable expectations and a shared understanding mm -hmm. before the project even, even starts, I think, can be good. Yeah. Um, Dr. Nelson, there are many types of research. You mentioned that you predominantly did clinical um, clinical research, and but there's certainly opportunities to do basic science, translational work, prospective trials, um, surgical education. Do you think it's possible for individuals to dabble in multiple areas, or do you think it's important to just stick to one type of research? Um, so as I mentioned before I did research, I, um, my goals were to um, focus on clinical research. Uh -huh. um, and I think it's important to know what you want to accomplish before you do research years and to have that be your number one priority. Um, and so uh, when I got started, I just focused on retrospective data reviews. I got a master's at uh, the same time. And I tried to have multiple areas work have overlap with one another. Yeah. Um, so the master's degree helped with the retrospective data reviews. And then once I felt like I started to master clinical research, then I added in um, other work, like working on a prospective trial. And um, I even added in, it wasn't really truly basic science. It was more like a rehash of basic science data. Sure. Um, but, uh, um, but I even tried to have that tie in with my other clinical work. Um, and so I think it's, uh, it's, it's possible to have multiple overlapping areas. I think it's fine to have one singular focus and yeah. to, to be good at that. And if you want to add in more branching areas, kind of like what I did, uh, to have them overlap with one another is really helpful. And I know none of you have done specific basic science bench work time during your residencies, but for me, I did do um, two of my th three years of research were basic science. And honestly, 
If you're spending hours sitting there watching a gel run, you know, those are the perfect times to do chart reviews or come up with, you know, a curricular initiative that you can evaluate and get into the surgical education realm. So I do think it's possible to kind of spread yourself in different directions and learn different things. Like you said, as long as everything's overlapping and it's kind of shared, shared skill set. Yeah, and you've done some translational work as well, Dr. Mitchell. Correct? Right, so I think I might actually offer a slightly contrary opinion uh, to Dr. Okay. Nelson. I uh, am a big proponent uh, or advocate for the belief that, you know, research time, you know, you're, there are several goals, one of which is productivity. Another one is kind of building out your toolbox and, you know, leaving the two or three years with as many tools that you can apply, you know, in your career going forward as possible. Um, and with, without a breadth of exposure, um, you may be either limiting yourself to some extent or, um, you know, in my case, as an example, not uh, being exposed to things that you would not have previously thought about. Right. Uh, so, you know, breadth is important, depth is important. Rule number one, I think, is productivity and, and getting things done that you commit to. but. You know, so far as it's possible, I would I would advocate for you know exposure to multiple areas. Yeah, that's great insight, and I think it's good to have different opinions just so we can share a variety of perspectives. Dr. Jobert, another one of the benefits that Dr. Nelson mentioned about dedicated research time is being able to go to meetings, networking, and whatnot. You've had the opportunity to attend a few meetings during your research time and even after your research time. Um, can you share some of your perspectives about what some of these advantages are of these in-person live events? Yeah, so the meetings definitely don't end with your two years of dedicated research because a lot of your projects actually are um, being accepted for publication or, or presentation after the fact. So um, yes, you continue to go on uh, meetings and meet people after your dedicated research time. It's been wonderful to meet um, other residents who are doing research, yeah. other attendings who are mentoring residents. During these meetings, it's, it really is a small world. Yeah. So you can, you can uh, collaborate with others on projects with, um, you know, with social media and as easy it is, as it is to just make phone calls, speak via FaceTime. You can, you can work with others outside of your institution. And then you get new ideas by coming Absolutely. to these meetings. Definitely. And, um, and you can ask for advice uh, from others who are here uh, in the same situation you are. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of ways that your own research can benefit from attending these meetings and seeing what other people are doing. Just to take a little bit of a different direction, um, Dr. Mitchell, a lot of people talk about using the time in the lab for things like personal growth, family growth, personal maturation. Can you talk to us, not to put you on the spot but a little bit, about how you might have personally changed for the better during the time that you've been spending in the lab? So I think I've grown personally in many ways, um, but one of, the, one of the benefits of dedicated research time is that you have the flexibility both to be productive and learn uh, and commit to the work that you're doing, but also devote extra time and energy to areas of your life that otherwise might not have received as much focus during your clinical training. Um, so in the last two years, while being somewhat productive. I'm writing a ton of papers and getting um, an enormous number of presentations. I've been able to travel internationally with my wife. Uh, I got a dog. I've been able to exercise a little more than I was previously. <laughs> and uh, I became a father two months ago. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, as a matter of fact, I think actually David, Aaron, and I all had children on uh, <laughs> on research time, so I think all three of us can attest yeah. to the opportunities the for personal growth. My first two children are 19 months apart and were born during my lab time as well. So yes, it's a, it's a popular phenomenon when we <laughs> see, our, see our partners more frequently. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. right. Yes. Well, I didn't have any children, but I met my future husband <laughs> Which is also research, wonderful. So. Yeah. So, no, I think uh, there's so much to be said about really developing, you know, well-being and personal growth during that time and being able to take a step back after really intense clinical training and saying, to be a good physician, to be a good surgeon, I need to not only have a skill set and to have knowledge and to be familiar with the literature, but I need to be a well-rounded human being. And I think that it's a great opportunity to really develop that. Um, I know we've talked about a lot of aspects related to the research time, and we're running out of time for our, our discussion today. But I did want to briefly touch on the idea of, um, of getting an advanced degree. I was wondering, Dr. Carcini, if you can just mention a little bit about 
uh, your perspective about getting an advanced degree during the dedicated research time? Sure, so I think that advanced degrees come up a lot in the conversation of dedicated research time because there is a great opportunity to add this to your likely two years and it may enhance your career depending on what you'd like to do. Um, for myself, I am getting a master's degree um, in clinical science, um, but the coursework all may um, either enhance or um, uh, your uh, research interests um, and career development to varying degrees. So for example, there is are courses that I'm taking in biostats or translational medicine, um, developing clinical trials, and those all um, touch upon uh, my career goals in a variety of ways, some to a greater extent than others. Uh, certainly biostats has been greatly advantageous to my career, and I feel like I'm applying that greatly. But a master's degree is not without a great amount of time and commitment, and so I think it's important for each person to decide if that time is well spent towards a degree or towards time specifically in the lab. Sure. And does anyone know of other individuals who did um, research time and got other types of degrees during that time period? Um, one of my co-residents got a PhD. I think that's yeah. less common, though. Yeah, yeah, it's not so common. I got a master's in public health while I I was on dedicated research time, and the the coursework and my interests overlapped. Um, Perfect. So yeah. it it really was a good collaboration. Well, that's great. Well, I think we're just out about of time, um, but I'm wondering if anyone has any closing thoughts, any last couple of sentences they want to just mention about their experience with the research or recommendations for. Um, residents who want to go into CT surgery and are wondering if they should go into any dedicated research time? I guess my closing thoughts would be for anybody who's on the fence or thinking about whether or not they want to do lab time to do it um, because it's been enormously beneficial in a number of ways for me and it's far exceeded my expectations. Agree. So go for it. I'd second that. Terrific. Well, we thank you very much for your attention today. We hope that you found the CTS Net Roundtable helpful. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again.